Now we're ready. So thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Phil Whitley. Um, I'm the CTO of a company called Kinetics, which is located up in Lehigh. And I'm going to talk to you today about building apps on post-web 2.0 architectures. If you went to my keynote yesterday, you got a piece of that. But I'll talk a little bit in more detail uh, about what I mean by that. Um, not necessarily the um, philosophy behind it, but you know the technology. And hopefully, by before we get done, we'll write some code and uh, have a little fun. So the first thing to talk about is what do I mean when I talk about personal clouds. What is a personal cloud and how can we think about it? Well, there's a number of different ways we could we could talk about it. But you'll notice personal clouds down here in the right-hand corner. Um, every problem known to man can be solved by two-dimensional matrices, or two-by-two two matrices. <laughs> or understood, I guess. Maybe not solved, but understood. So here's my two-by-two two matrix. So, you know, at the top, we've got tap day on centralized control. We've got individual decentralized control. Uh, on the columns, we've got connected and standalone. And you'll notice um, that top down centralized control, we had big web companies and mainframes, right? Um, individual decentralized control, we've got personal clouds and personal computers. Doc Searles, I don't know if you know Doc, he writes for Linux Journal. Um, he's very involved in this kind of how do individuals get power uh, from technology kind of philosophy. He, he made an interesting uh, point in an email last week about how um, computers got interesting when they got personal. Networks got interesting when they got personal. Um, mobile technology got interesting when it got personal, right? Instead of being you know, radios that companies used, it became something that everybody used. He believes that cloud will get interesting when it gets personal, and I happen to agree with him. Um, so, what are some of the philosophies behind personal clouds? First is control over terms. Right? Not about going somewhere and clicking on terms of service and essentially having uh, to accept or not accept. Right? If you want service, you pretty much agree to give them your firstborn child and they can change the terms at any point. Terms of service are broken, and I won't go into detail on that. We could have a whole talk on how terms of service are completely broken. Um, so control over terms. Control over apps. Right? I don't want to sign up for clouds where somebody else decides what apps they run. I want to have clouds where I decide what apps they run. And then most importantly, I think, is control over data. Um, I wrote a blog post a couple months ago about what happens when Flickr dies. Because Flickr will die. It's only a matter of time. I mean, it's no, if you look at the history of companies, companies live long, shorter and shorter and shorter periods of time. Services die, services go away. I started using Postgres in 2008, it died this year. Um, everything will eventually die. What happens when Flickr dies? What happens to your pictures? Are they yours, are they somebody else's? Will they give you the chance to export them? Who knows? So personal clouds are about these three types of control. So now, how does, he, how does the personal cloud differ from something like Dropbox or iCloud? Um, one way to talk about Dropbox and iCloud is to think about them as service-oriented. So mostly when we think about the web, Web 2.0, Web 2.0 is mostly service-oriented. We go from service to service to service, and we sign up for whatever service that Web 2.0 company provides, and we use it. But they're really silos. And we're using them, but we're the integration point. Right? If I want to integrate two of these services, I have to integrate them. Now, somebody might use an API and write it for me, but nevertheless, I'm kind of the integration point between those things. Now, a different way to look at it is subject-oriented, right? or entity-oriented, or person-oriented. All of those three terms could be synonymous. Subject-oriented, entity-oriented, person-oriented. And in this case, there is some cloud that I own and control that is mediating those services for me. That's what we mean when we talk about subject-oriented versus service-oriented. And so when we talk about personal clouds, we're looking at some things that are subject-oriented. The cloud belongs to me, and then I run apps on it, as opposed to service-oriented, where this cloud belongs to somebody else, and I just use it. Now, technically, I mentioned this yesterday, I mentioned these things called persistent computational objects or PICOs, 
Um, persistent computational objects, a personal cloud is a constellation of picos. So it may be that your personal cloud is a single pico. A pico is this kind of online virtual computer in my world. Right? And we could, uh, you know, whether, whether my representation of picos is the one that wins or somebody else has something, that's, uh, that, that's not necessarily as important as the idea that I believe personal clouds are made up of multiple computational objects. Now, I'm going to talk specifically about my viewpoint and my technology for doing this. At the end, I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the other technologies that people are developing that have a similar philosophy. Um, so Picos, like I said, are little online computers. They are virtual in the sense that we can host thousands or tens of thousands, hopefully millions of them on single instances of a, of a computer. They are lightweight enough that you can unsuspend this virtual machine, run the program, and resuspend it in a matter of seconds, often under a second. That, that's the goal. Uh, they're, they're globally unique, so everyone has a unique identifier, and that's very important. They are also persistent, meaning they maintain their state in between these run sessions, right? So it's not very interesting if every time I boot this computer up, it comes up into a, a brand new state. That's kind of like DOS. Um, remember DOS? <laughs> um, so they're persistent. So they remember what state they were in every time we boot them up. They're programmable. So there are programs that you can write on them. There are also programs that you can use, write that use them. And they're interactive with each other. They form networks, which is a very important idea. So, um, think of every, everything that says personal cloud. That could be a single Pico, it could be multiple Picos. The idea is that it is under someone's authority, right? Some person or some company has authority over that personal cloud. And I've tried to draw this picture to show that they are running at different hosting companies, or perhaps even being self-hosted. Um, and the connections, you'll note, are between the clouds themselves, not between the hosting companies. So in other words, my hosting company and your code hosting company don't have to have an agreement. They don't have to share software or anything else in order for my cloud and your cloud to talk to each other, which is kind of how we want this thing to work. Now, I think that the architecture of a post-Web 2.0 post web 2.0 world has to look like the internet. Meaning it won't look like web 2.0 because web 2.0 does not look anything like the internet. The internet is composed of decentralized protocol mediated peers. That is not what web 2.0 looks like. They are not decentralized, they are not peers, and they are not protocol mediated. Um, think about how mail works. You have a mail system, I have a mail system, you might host your own mail system, you might use somebody else's, some big company might host it for you, but it doesn't matter. Uh, I can send mail to you. We both use different clients. You use mail.app, I use Outlook. Actually, I don't use Outlook, but, uh, but, but the point is, is that as long as you have an IMAP client and I have an IMAP client, the mail companies don't care what client you use because there's a protocol there. It doesn't matter what company hosts our email because there's a protocol there. And it can be completely decentralized. We can, we can exchange email regardless of that. That's how the internet works. That's how I believe, that's the world we have to get to as we move towards a post-web 2.0 world. Um, and this idea of self-hosting is very important. I don't necessarily believe that most <coughs> people are going to self-host these things. Because I frankly think most people don't want to be bothered. I think there are technical issues, particularly security, which could be a problem. But I think it's important that you are able to. If you're technically able to self-host, you ought to be able to. That's how email works. Most of us don't host our own email servers anymore. But you could if you wanted to, and that's a very important one. Um, now, as I, uh, as I said, I think Pete goes, lead us to a brand new programming model. And I want to share that programming model with you today. Now, I showed this sl slide yesterday, um, but I want to emphasize it and 
talk about it in, in some detail. So this is the way most Web 2.0, most, most web applications look, right? What is Web 2.0? What do you want to label Web 2.0 or not? Most web applications look like this. There is some application logic which contains presentation and business stuff. And then there's some back-end database which contains the model for the, the application that's being built. And there are a lot of different technologies for doing this, right? There's PHP, there's you know, frameworks, there's you know, enterprise Java beans if you're you know, inclined that way. There's lots of different things that you can do to build this part. But that doesn't matter. Regardless of what technology you use, this is the abstract model of how your application is built. This is the model that personal clouds represent. So personal clouds break the application data. And I'm saying application data, actually what we're going to see is it's a little bit more than just data. It's not just about the data. But nevertheless, we break the application data away from the web application itself and make them orthogonal to each other. We make them orthogonal to each other. Now actually, you could slide this over and have the web application talking to someone's personal cloud, but the, the, the picture doesn't look different enough to actually start to understand what's going on. So what I'm going to show you today is a way to do this in the browser with JavaScript that is I mean, the web application has absolutely no connection to this database, but that's not, that's not required. What, what's required is that the data system, the personal cloud, be separable from the rest of the application so that it can be under a different authority, so that it is decentralized. In the same way that IMAP is separate from the mail system, we want to make sure that we can separate the personal cloud system, the, the, the part that belongs to the person, from the application itself. Now, there's a lot of reasons to do this. Um, one reason to do it is we create a system that is more modular. And my philosophy is that modularity wins. There is a great book, by the way, called Design Rules by um, Who's the president of BYU Idaho? Uh, Tim Clark. Uh, when he was at Harvard Business School, um, the dean of Harvard Business School, he wrote a book called Modularity Rules or Design Rules. It's all about the history of modularity inside the computer industry. And it's fascinating to see the power that modularity gave to computer systems. And, and frankly, the IBM 360 was the start of it all. Uh, the, the IBM 360 opened up this whole idea of modularity inside computer systems. You all understand the, mo the, the power of modularity. We use it every day. Every time we write a function, we're using modularity. Every, everything we do, everything that gives us power and flexibility comes from modularity. And the proposal that I'm making here about personal clouds and separating the data from the web application is all about modularity. Not to mention the fact that if you don't have to build a data store and host it, it's less work and less money for you. Uh, you can build an application and not have to do all of it. So I'm going to um, demo uh, the same thing I demoed yesterday uh, and, and talk in a little bit more detail about what's happening. Um, I'm also, and, and then after that, we're going to build an application. Well, actually, not so much build. We're actually going to cut and paste an application, but, you know, there will be real code on the screen. Um, so, so we're going to uh, cut and paste an application that does the same thing so that you can see in detail how it works. But the key ideas that you're going to see in this application are an application written in JavaScript that could be hosted anywhere. I mean, you could literally just move this onto your computer and just load the, the JavaScript from your computer. It doesn't even have to be online. It could be a Chrome extension. It could be... Um, or a Chrome app, it could be you know, anything you like. Um, the app is going to use data and connections and functionality from the personal cloud. So it's not just about data, there's also uh, connections and other functionality we're going to talk about. 
The app is not going to store any user passwords. It's not going to know about user data. It's not even really going to know, other than being architected to link to a personal cloud, it's not going to necessarily know it has users. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to use the connections inside the cloud to create um, the contact information. Okay. And uh, obviously the personal clouds could be running on different servers, although I'm only going to link to one. Um, now, as some of you have been familiar with Kinetics before, um, what you're not going to see is any KRL, Kinetics rule language. Um, it turns out that there is KRL involved. The whole personal cloud system is written 100% in KRL. There's nothing else there. Um, but um, we're not going to show any. We're not going to write any. It's not required in order to use the system to know KRL or write it. And you're not going to see any databases. We're, we're not going to fire up or, or connect any databases. So let me... Um, So not, if I just go to the Forever site, right, I'm here. Um, I want you to pay attention to the language that's here. It doesn't say log in. It says start by linking Forever to your personal cloud. Now, this blue button says click here to link to SquareTag. The other one that's faded out says click here to link to Newstar P Cloud. Newstar is one of our partners. Um, you may not be familiar with Newstar. They're probably the largest public company you've never heard of, um, at least technology company. If you have ever moved your phone from AT&T to Verizon, did anyone go the other way? If you've ever moved your phone from AT&T to Verizon, you kept the same phone number, Newstar is the company that does that. They essentially built DNS for phone numbers back in 1996 as part of some um, government contract and became a company. They also run like the do, .us registrar and the .biz registrar and, uh, I'm sorry, not registrar, registry. And, and so they, they do a lot of this kind of back-end infrastructure. Uh, they, they work pretty closely with us. Um, we get um, a good portion of our funding from them. It's not online yet, but we're uh, working towards having them have an online personal cloud presence. So you'd be able to link to two. And in fact, um, one of the things that you should be able to do is host your own and link your own personal cloud in here. This app shouldn't care. Right? So that's, that's where we're headed. We're not quite there yet, but that's where we're headed. So when we link to SquareTag, what's going to happen is it's going to fire up SquareTag, which is a, a, another app that, that happens to be a personal cloud. And you'll notice that this looks like an OAuth dance, and it is. Um, and so I'm going to authorize Forever to use my personal cloud, and it says, congratulations, Forever is now linked to your personal cloud. And so, for example, I can go to my profile, and uh, this profile is being pulled out of my personal cloud. Forever doesn't know what my profile is. Think about just the niceness of that, if you never had to fill out a profile at a website anymore. Uh, and, and that's a key idea, is that while I'm being a little bit... Um, hyperbolic, I'm pushing this idea of no data, no logins to its extreme, you don't have to push it to the extreme. You could allow people to link in their personal clouds and use things like their profile and their connections while your app does its own thing and keeps its own data. There's no reason not to do a hybrid model if that's what makes sense for the app. And Forever is also an app that doesn't need any of its own data, and so it's easy to say, okay, we're not going to store anything. But there are a lot of there's a lot of persistent data that apps need to keep for themselves that doesn't relate to users specifically. And in that case, your app would probably also have a database to keep track of its own data. But this is my profile, and like I said, it's coming out of my personal cloud. Um, I also have a number of connections, and these connections are also coming from my personal cloud. So Forever doesn't know who my connections are. It just asks my personal cloud, who are your connections? And um, so, for example, I'm connected to Allison Smith, and um, you can't see it because it's way too small, but 
This is actually built to run on an iPhone. That's why the buttons are so big. It's, it's meant to look good on an iPhone. <coughs> and so make phone call actually is using the, dot, the tel uh, schema. And so if this were on a phone and you clicked make phone call, it would actually fire up and, and make the phone call. Uh, same thing with send text message. So on my computer, send email is the only one that works because the mail to scheme is the only one that works here. Uh, you know, and I have other friends. Um, ben and Allison are actually actors from a video we shot last year. That's not their real name. That was their name in the video. Uh, but anyway, um, so I have some friends. I have a friend finder, so I can send out an invitation. What I'm doing is I'm sending out an invitation to somebody connect to my personal cloud. I'm not sending them an invitation to use forever. And in fact, connections that my personal cloud has work here even if those people aren't using forever. They don't even have to know forever exists for this to make sense and work for me. Um, yeah, just, to, just to show you the idea of the personal cloud, I did this yesterday, but to make sure that we're clear here, this is, um, let's um, pull that up a little bit. So this is actually my SquareTag account. Um, and if I go to my profile over in SquareTag and uh, you know, change my name to Philip there, and come into forever, um, and reload that page, it now says fill it. So I pulled that out of the personal cloud as I hit that, yeah. Do you envision any sort of uh, permission structure where you say, you know, uh, you do have permission to update my profile? Yeah, I so, so um, I want to show a picture to talk about that. So remind me right after the demo and I'll go to the picture and talk about that. Okay, but that's a great question. Yeah. Um, so I can save the changes here. And when I come back to uh, square tag and refresh my profile, the changes are there. Right, so in other words, these changes really are happening in my personal cloud. They're happening in a place that I control, not that forever controls. Now, um, that, that's, that's the, probably the, the primary um, thing I want to show about forever. Um, Let's, let, me, let me go to this picture and, uh, and talk about the question there. So the question was, do you envision permissioning? And so it's, it's, a, it's a very important and interesting question because when forever links to my personal cloud, um, it's using OAuth to link to my personal cloud. But if I want my cloud to link to somebody else's cloud. Actually, I think I have a better picture. Did I put that picture in? <coughs> no, I didn't put it in. Yeah, sorry. If I want my cloud to link to somebody else's cloud, doing an OAuth dance at that point is a little bit weird. It's, it's hard. It's hard to imagine what the user experience is. Because when I say, find a friend in forever and have them go and connect, the, the OAuth dance is a little bit interesting to ha happen there. So what we do is we have this idea of subscriptions. And so when you create a connection, you're creating what's called a subscription. And it's not OAuth, although it's OAuth-like in the sense that there are tokens involved. And it's asking the other person, sending the other person, do you want to connect? I already know I want to connect. So when they say yes, it actually is the permissions that link those. Now the finer grained question is how do we how do we permission what goes across that wire? For example, I may want to allow um, all of you, because you're my friends, to get my profile data, but I may not trust the company I just linked to to have my profile data. I may only want them to be able to send me messages through my personal cloud, which is a, a feature that's built in. Um, so we need to be able to essentially put policies on each of those channels. And that's exactly the idea. We're not quite there yet. We are working on the policy part, but it's not in place yet. It's not in production. So that you can permission each of these channels to be specific as to what they're allowed to do. Right? And so um, the policy turns out to be a better solution than something like OAuth for this exact solution. I I'm planning to talk about this in some detail next week at Internet Identity Workshop where there are all the people who invented OAuth, and I'm hoping to get some feedback on what the policies ought to be like. So, um, 
All right, so the technology stack behind the um, personal clouds is open source. Uh, and it uses, as you saw, open standards like OAuth. Um, there are, of course, new things we're doing, like how do you do a notification? There's not really a, a standard that fits there, and so there are new things that are coming up. Uh, and one of, the, one of the problems that you'll notice about this is I'm storing profile data. Well, what's the schema? Because you could write an app that uses personal clouds. You could write an app right now, have it linked to SquareTag, <coughs> Get profile data out of it. How do you know what that schema is? Well, we're going to document that schema, but how do we agree on the schema? But for things like profiles and subscriptions, we're essentially going to say, here's the schema for profiles. Here's how subscriptions work. We have you know, standards on our development site that says how that works. But what, what if you want to start something new and somebody else wants to use it? There is a schema slash standards problem here. And I'll say problem because standards are problems, right? I mean, if we're going to have decentralized protocol mediated things, we need standards. And one of the big problems with standards like this is how do they, um, how do they come to be? Right? If we have to wait six years for every time we want a new data schema, that's probably not going to work. So uh, th there are, there are um, potential solutions. Uh, semantic data interchange, although not necessarily RDF, is one possibility. And I, th I think that being able to map schemas is probably the best hope we have for quickly getting up to speed on this. Um, so as I mentioned, the primary purpose of the app is the user interface and business logic. And personal clouds can support any number of apps. It's not just about forever, it's about all of the apps that we might want to use or, or write that users might want to store data about. So let's Let's build an app. Um, so, if I go to my browser, did I close it? <coughs> no, there it is. Oh, it's still in full screen mode. Okay. Um, So I've got this little um, thing called todo.windley.com. And this is a little JavaScript app. Let me make that bigger. A little JavaScript app. I actually got the idea from this blog post, built for the web, created a to-do list with jQuery. Um, and it works like this, right? I can add things to my to-do list. And I can delete them. And it works great unless I reload. So as long as I want to keep my browser always open and to this page, then the to-do list works great. But there's no persistence in it. It's just a jQuery to-do list. It's just all in the browser, all show. So what we want to do is we want to add um, persistence to this using a personal cloud. So I'm going to come over here, blow this up a little bit so you can see. And I'm going to copy that file, index.html, to Linkable. Okay, so Linkable is the name of the persistent app, okay, because it's going to link to our personal <coughs> cloud. Um, now, I, I do have to copy it to Linkable because if you know how OAuth works, I had to tell the server what the return address of was, uh, was for the OAuth dance, and Linkable is the name I gave it. So. I can't choose some other name without going into the personal cloud and changing um, the, the app registration. So I've already registered this app from an OAuth standpoint with SquareTag and it knows about it. So we're not going to do any of that. Now, um, if I look at Here's the code. I'm going to um, leave it small for the tour and then blow it up for the um, for the for the demonstration. So you'll notice that there is uh, it uses Twitter Bootstrap in the CSS. 
Uh, there's some other style stuff for the app. Um, it's loading jQuery 1.7.2, and then it has the actual JavaScript functions which are making this all work. So there is, um, we, we are adding a click handler to the add to do button. We're adding a click handler to the Dell to do button. Um, and we're checking if the to do list is, is empty so that we can put up a message. Okay? So, so that's the primary uh, pieces of this application. Um, there's a function called add to do list item which is actually in charge of creating the HTML and adding it to uh, the, the to-do list and binding the click for the checkbox and all of that, right? So, so this function in conjunction with the click handler for add to-do or what make the to-do list function work. So in order to make this persistent, uh, we have to do a little bit of housekeeping. So the first thing we have to do is we have to add some JavaScript for the Cloud OS JS library. So this is a library, uh, which I would characterize right now as early alpha, that is essentially some JavaScript commands which know how to talk to the personal cloud. That's, that's all it is. Um, and I won't go through it, but you, I could be happy to talk about it with you later. Okay. So we're going to add that. The other thing we're going to add is we're going to add the um, menu items in the uh, menu that was up at the top, right? Remember this, it has this black menu up at the top. We're going to add menu items um, inside the to-do list menu. So that's right here, so we're just going to add those in. Uh, and you'll notice that they are both display none in their style, so even if we go over here after we've added them in, make sure we're at the right place. Um, so, there's nothing there because they're hidden, okay? So it looks, it looks and operates exactly the same because all we've done is, is added some hidden fields and, and put in the, um, the JavaScript call. So the next thing we want to do is we want to actually wire those login and logout buttons up. And this is the most complicated chunk of code that we're going to uh, stick in. And I'm just going to put it in here and then talk about it, um, walk you through what's going on. So, all the rest of the stuff we're going to put in is pretty small, but this is, this is, this is not. So, the first thing we do here is we get the OAuth URL from the library, Cloud OS library, and we're just going to attach that to the login button, right? So we're just going to paint that onto the login button so that the login button has a link. When we click it, it goes to the OAuth server. Uh, we're going to retrieve the session if possible. It may not work, but we're going to try and retrieve it. And then we're going to say, okay, if we're in an authenticated session, then show the login button, or show the logout button and hide the login button. If we're not in an authenticated session, Hide the log out button and show the log in button. That's this line, these two lines. And then finally process, since we're not authenticated, see if there is a OAuth token in the string, or in the query string. If you remember how OAuth works, uh, you go out to the server, it makes a call back with a big long um, shared secret in the URL. Uh, now, we're in a pure JavaScript app, so we don't have some hidden web service somewhere that's running that that can call. So it's actually going to call our JavaScript app, and our JavaScript app is going to process that. There are some, some security concerns there that I'll talk about later. Um, and then finally, we're going to add the uh, logout functionality to the logout button. We're going to remove the session. We're going to hide the logout button, show the login button. We're going to clear the to-do list items. Okay, so, so that's all of the functionality that uh, makes the authenticate button work. So we should be able now to um, reload, and you'll notice we have a logout button. Um, so, so when we click login, it should take us over, yeah, and lets us authenticate. So we're going to authenticate. 
And now it says log out. And this is basically all it does. We can log in and log out, but nothing else is happening, right? The log in and log out buttons are working, and we can use them to um, log in and log out of our app. So that's good. So the next thing we want to do is we want to make it so that when we add something here, right, this still goes away. We haven't done anything with that. Um, what we want to do is we want to show what's there. So if there's something already in the personal cloud, we want to show it. And so right now, it turns out that I just linked this to my personal cloud, and there are some to-do items in my personal cloud that you're not seeing because we're not doing anything to show. So that's the next thing we're going to do. Um, is right under this authenticate section, we're going to add an initialize section. In initialize, so what we're doing is we're calling, let me move that up. We're calling PDS list with a namespace of to do and giving it a callback function, which essentially is going to, for everything in the list that comes back, call this function. And this function is going to call the add to do list item. Remember, that's that JavaScript function I showed you earlier that basically sticks things in the to do list and wires up the click box so that it does the right thing. And we're also going to write something to the console log, but that's not important. So now if I save this, go back to my app and reload, there should be some things there. Yeah, so there's the, so there's the items that were already in my personal cloud because it's now grabbing them and showing them to me. So the next thing we want to do is we want to wire up the add because we're still not adding things into my personal cloud. Right? So if I reload, if I um, add something and then reload, they just go away. And this is pretty easy as well. So there is, um, I mean, you can see basically all we're doing is we're doing the uh, basic CRUD functions here, right? So um, remember up here, we have this uh, click handler for the add to do. When you click that add button, this is the click handler that's handling it. So inside here, you'll notice it calls the add to do list item function, which is the thing that paints everything. Uh, at the same place that we do that, we're just going to um, paste in this function. And this function is the Cloud OS personal data store add function. Notice it's using the same namespace. And it's using the to-do ID, which is, <coughs> and it's using the description, which is gotten from the description box. And this function, the callback function, is just logging because there's nothing else for it to do. And so now, if we come here, reload this, add uh, water to the sidewalk, um, and reload, <coughs> keep water to the sidewalk so it stays. Um, and I'm not doing anything to order these. That would be, you know, left for an exercise to the reader, I guess. Okay, so the final, the final step is if I delete things here, they go away in the UI, but they're still there. I haven't deleted them from the cloud, right? So they're still there. So um, we'll come back over here, we'll grab the last little bit of code, and inside the, the click handler for the to-do list, we'll add this in. And so this, um, as you'd expect, is pretty simple. It just takes the uh, to-do ID in the to-do namespace and calls the personal data store delete, and then the, the callback function just logs that so that we can tell that it happened. So now we come over here and delete water the sidewalk and reload water the sidewalk is gone. So we've got a completely functional to-do list application now that is linked to my personal cloud, right? When I log in, I get the things back that, that I had. Um, and if you used one of your square tags yesterday, if you used your square tag to sign up for square tag, you could go to todo.windley.com slash linkable right now uh, let's see, would you have to install the app? No, you don't have to install the app. I think you could just go and click login, and this should work for you. 
And it'll keep your to-do list item separate from mine, obviously, because it wouldn't be very interesting if there were only one to-do list for all of us. Right? So, so it is person-specific. They are personal clouds. Um, you'll notice that th that's all handled by the cloud OS itself. That isn't something that we as a programmer had to deal with. We didn't have to multi-home this application. We didn't have to build a database. We didn't have to do any of that because we're essentially using this uh, personal cloud application. Was that a question or just scratching? Just, yeah. question. So if, if we have an app that we want to integrate with the personal cloud that's not, that doesn't have data that fits your already defined schemas, essentially that JavaScript library that you're using the cloud OS one, we don't have to make ourselves. Is that correct? No. no. You can, so the schemas are completely free form. Okay. So you could pick, I mean, your namespacing in the to-do namespace, I could just put any namespace I want. Right, you can put any namespace you want there. You could just put, um, you know, for it's probably a good idea <coughs> to use the registered name of your app. When you, when you go through OAuth, you know OAuth, right? You have to register the app. So you have to register the app with SquareTag for it to know that it's there. You'll get an ID for the app. You probably ought to use that for your namespace just to avoid walking over somebody. That would probably be a best practice. Although there are some that we think will probably make standard. Obviously, Profile's one. To-do list might be another, and, and some that then everybody might want to use. But yeah, you put any namespace here, and then you just throw J JSON at it, and it stores JSON. So you can namespace it any way you want. Um, you'll, you'll notice that I am... So right here in this line, if you take a look, you'll notice that what I'm doing is I'm also putting like path information in here so that I have an ID that could have multiple parts of it so that I can essentially namespace within my app for different things as well. And so you, when you look at the ID, you know where it goes yeah. visually? Yeah. Well, and also that if I had different kinds of to-do items, I could have A and B there, and then I could separate the A's from the B's. I mean, that's, you basically have paths, you have namespaces, and you have JSON. Okay. Yeah, question. Back. Yeah, question. There's two. Let's go here and then we'll go back there. Okay, so going along with the schema stuff, do you ever imagine defining um, some way to, like you talked about yesterday, being able to look at potholes and be able to describe those, that schema with that. Do you imagine creating uh, a protocol for being able to describe schema for anything like in the world? Because I imagine that, you know, this is one to-do list. But there may be another application that wants to do the same thing, and maybe I want to port my data over between that. How are they supposed to know about the schema between those? Should there be some way to discover the schema? That so there, there will be, I think, a variety of answers. Um, I think there will be de facto standards. Right? There will be de jure standards, which actually are hammered out, that are important. Uh, I think there will also be a, a lot of room for semantic mapping. Right, the fact that I called this to do and you called it um, uh, foo, but in fact we're really storing more or less the same data, and there's a way to map them. And now we can just ask the mapping agent to map them for us. Right, so we anticipate that there will be a semantic data mapping agent behind all of this at some point. Because I, I don't, I don't see any other way to actually get the 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 volume of interaction that people are going to want. I mean, it, it's one thing to say we're going to use SMTP for email. Right? Email works great. But when you start saying we're going to have random data that gets exchanged, you really do need semantic data interchange. Now, I'm not a big, I'm not a big believer in RDF, but I do believe that Tim Berners-Lee probably was about 10 to 15 years ahead of everybody else when he started talking about semantic data. I remember for like eight or nine years thinking about why do I care about this? Why does it matter? I don't, I don't, but now I understand. I mean, I have real problems that semantic mapping could solve. Uh, I, you know, RDF is a completely different discussion, but. Yeah, so I, I yeah, I just, I don't know. I, I would say that finding some way to define a way to make extensions to a standard schema that says you can discover what extensions this this yeah. Model has. Yeah. Obviously. Being able to discover yeah. Discovery that. is important because yeah. that's the first step towards semantic mapping. Yeah. Because I'm going to map your schema to this schema. I at least have to discover yeah. what they are. Yeah. So that's a that, that's a great first step. There was a question back in the back. 
Uh, I was going to ask uh, about the data storage. You said that it stored in JSON. Well, it's stored as JSON. It's actually back in the back end. It's stored in Mongo, but okay. it is stored as JSON. So you separated the, the data from the apps as you described, but, but it seems like the data is still hosted on your server. And, and if you're talking a, a, a trillion node network, that's that's not going to work either. What's the next step to, to break the data out so that it's on my server or, or you know wherever I choose it to be? Yeah, so I think the answer to that is the same answer that the internet has for mail, which is, it can be hosted lots of places. And some of those places are going to be big. Right? Gmail and Hotmail are pretty darn big mail systems. But they're still just mail systems. And they interact with the one I host on my box just fine. And so I think that's really the answer. There's going to be big hosters of these things. There's going to be small, you know, host it yourself. Um, we're not quite there, but I'm working hard to get a Amazon image of all of this. Uh, standing it up is not for the faint of heart, unfortunately, at this point. But people have done it. Uh, but uh, I want to get an Amazon image so you can just, you know, clone the image and fire this up and start running it. So you could store all of your data on your own image. You could run it on your own server if that's what you wanted to do in your home. Uh, it's kind so of an aside, like but there's source? an actual interesting. There's an interesting reason to run it in your homes because the. Uh, uh, Fourth Amendment actually applies to your home, but it doesn't apply to Google. Right? They, they, can't, they can't come into your home and take your server out of your house without a search warrant, but they can get your data out of Google without a search warrant. So, I mean, that's a hole in the law. So I suspect there will be some people that will, will want to host it themselves. So, so to follow up, so, so when you load up your to-do app, how would you tell the to-do app where your data is? Yeah, so that's what this that's what this linking is, right? So, um, well, so let's go to forever. That's that's easier to see. So, right now you're just linking the square tag, but you can't see the URL down here. But it's just a URL. So you could, if you were hosting it yourself, grab that URL. You probably wouldn't make it by hand. You'd probably get it from the host. The, the host that you're using. And then up here, right, there would be a button that says provide your own link. You put it in and now forever is linked against the cloud running on your box in your house as opposed to SquareTag. And that all works right now. I mean that that does work. Right? So so that that part of the model is real. Um, and it's a very important part of the model. It, I'm definitely not out here to to create a yet another big place where all of your data has to be. I think the data has to be everywhere. And in fact, I don't believe all of your data is even going to be in one PDS. I think your PDS is really going to be a, um, a, a proxy for all of the other places. There's no reason why you shouldn't have stuff in Dropbox and iCloud that's also available inside your personal cloud. So that's the goal. So. Um, In this to-do list item, we or to-do list application, we all only use the CRUD services. Right? I showed you how to list things. I showed you how to add things. I showed you how to delete things. That's all we did. It turns out that the um, cloud office running on the Pico that makes up the personal cloud that's inside SquareTag, right? That sounds like a nursery rhyme, doesn't it? Um, that, that wiggle and jiggle and tickle inside of That's the one. Um, there are other services. So, for example, there's notifications. So there are in-app notification or in-cloud notifications. So your application doesn't actually have to know how to email somebody or how to SMS them. All it has to do is send a notification to their cloud and say, "Tell the user this," and then the user will get told in the way they've chosen to be notified. So they might want an SMS, they might want an email, they want might, might want carrier pigeons. We haven't built a carrier pigeon API yet, but. The user gets to choose how they get told through the notification service. And then, as we saw in, subscri in Forever, subscriptions are an important thing. We're actually creating links between personal clouds. Applications don't want to have to know how to create those links because it's a little complicated. And so 
the cloud takes care of all of that for you. The only thing the application has to do is, I want you to subscribe. When the application says, I want you to subscribe here, then it happens. That, that's all handled. Uh, and there are a lot of other services. If you think about an operating system and all the services that an operating system provides to developers, that's exactly what we want personal clouds to do. We want personal clouds to be the place that, that developers can create, or can use services and create their own. Um, in fact, the, it is extensible. So there is a meta, meta API that you can build into. So you can build your own API inside the cloud. So if your app needs a special service with its own API, you can actually build that inside the personal cloud without any help from us. You don't need to touch any of the back end code. You can just build that yourself. So it's all extensible. So again, that's the picture um, of the data. What other systems use a model like this? Uh, there's a, a thing called Camla Store, um, which is really about files and data, uh, but it is the same kind of you know separate modular uh, cloud technology. Own Cloud is interesting. The Own Cloud people are former SUSE uh, execs that have started Own Cloud, and so you can imagine it's very Linuxy. Um, they build it kind of as an enterprise Dropbox. I think it's probably something more than that. If you haven't been to unhosted.org, go look at unhosted.org and play around with it. Uh, there's actually a, a IETF standard called Remote Storage, which is based on OAuth, Webfinger, uh, and a few other protocols that allows you to create remote storage. It's just storage. So you couldn't do forever in it, for example, at least not easily, because it won't manage subscriptions or anything. But it's, it's a very cool idea. And then uh, Zephyr um, uh, is a, another cloud framework, um, supports remote storage. Uh, some friends of mine at a company called Respect Network are building Zephyr. Uh, so those are other options. I've talked about some of the challenges, schema. Uh, performance is always an issue, as you know. Uh, feature set, you know, we have some features, we'd like more. Security is always a big issue, especially if you're going to start storing real data. The reason we started with Square Tag is frankly because the security issues around keeping track of people's bags and bicycles is a lot less than keeping track of their health data, right? So th that's where we want to go. We want personal clouds to be able to store your personal health records, so there are security issues. Now, the reason I bring up all of these challenges is because this is open source. We're looking for a few hardy alpha developers that want to build apps against this and help us refine and build out this model. Uh, you don't have to be a JavaScript developer, although right now that's the model that we're working with. Um, and so please let me know. Like I said, we probably got room for two or three people, uh, and but we are looking for people who want to help build this out. Not necessarily program the back end, although if you're a Perl coder or a Mongo expert, we certainly would take any help we can get. Um, but but we do. Mark, we would. Um, Mark's jealous of his code. Um, but but uh, it is open source. It's all on GitHub. Just if you go to my blog, there's a little GitHub Opticat. Um, just click on the GitHub Opticat, and you'll go to my GitHub place, and then you can find all of the, these projects. Um, so that's it. There's my contact information again. Feel free to send me an email. Uh, follow me on Twitter. Uh, please read my blog. It makes me feel good. Uh, I know people read it. And uh, thank you very much.